Welcome to lecture 15, which is reconstruction, constructing the nation, putting it back together. Um, notice the date starts in 1863 and then runs to 1877. So it does include the Civil War itself. Bringing the Union back together actually began during the war itself because Lincoln saw this war effort um, and the reconstruction of the Union as basically the same thing. Putting the country back together was his job in his mind. Um, you see that in, as early as 1863, when Lincoln announced that if you took the oath of allegiance and, the, and agreed to the abolition of slavery, um, you could uh, be part of the process of bringing your state back into the Union. But you had to have 10% of the people in that state do this. 10% had to agree to abolition and an oath of allegiance. You may be thinking, wait a minute, 10%, that's not a whole lot. It's 90% who don't have to do that. And you'd be right. This is an extremely lenient, extremely easy way of reconstructing the Union because Lincoln wanted to go easy on states and encourage them to come back. Um, the other aspect of seeing um, planning for the post-war um, was in the 1865 Freedmen's Bureau, which was a way of dealing with the fact that so many people had been displaced by the war. There are African-Americans running around um, displaced. There are white folks displaced. And the job of the Freedmen's Bureau became to help African-Americans negotiate wage contracts, settle disputes with their former masters. They did hand out food and supplies to white people. Um, they just basically help deal with the fact that you've had a war, things are crazy. Um, so both whites and African-Americans benefited from the Freedmen's Bureau. Um, the goal of the Freedmen's Bureau, as far as ex-slaves was um, concerned, was to turn them into free wage laborers. That is, transplant the northern idea about uh, free wage um, thought into the South. Lincoln, as you know, is assassinated at the very end of the war, just after, just days after the war is over, and that leaves his vice president to take over. Andrew Johnson was quite a sour-faced man with a little bit of an alcohol problem. Um, he also had a deep-seated resentment of Southerners, uh, particularly rich Southerners. He grew up very poor, so he didn't like the wealthy, and he wanted, in his plans for Reconstruction, punishment of the wealthy people of the South. Um, at the same time as he wanted to punish the rich, he did offer very liberal or very free pardons to Southerners. Um, some 13,000 pardons we have um, granted by Johnson. You can actually read them, the letters people wrote asking for a pardon and then Johnson's decision on the matter. So in some ways, Johnson's policy is easy on the South while being harsh on the rich. Um, Johnson favored freedom for ex-slaves, but definitely not equality. Johnson is a deep, deep, seated racist um, who has no intention of thinking about African Americans as being equal to whites. Johnson's reconstruction plans being so easy and so accommodating kind of sent a signal to Southerners that maybe they're just going to be treated easily and they don't have to act defeated. So they didn't act defeated. They didn't act like people who had just been whipped in a major war. So they re-elected Confederates to Congress, their most die-hard pro-Southern guys, and figured, ah, you know, we'll just forget what happened and carry on like normal. Also, many Southern states were interested in limiting African American rights. So they um, passed a series of black codes that were designed to 
keep African Americans in a state of quasi slavery. Um, the sort of lack of remorse for the war and the limiting of African American rights suggests that the South did not feel any shame or anything bad about you know, the war itself at all. In fact, it seemed like that they were just, you know, trying to return to life as they knew it. And because President Johnson supported this point of view, Southerners kind of felt like um, they shouldn't have to feel guilty about losing the war. Johnson didn't support equality. Um, he didn't support the Freedmen's Bureau. Um, and in fact, he vetoed all congressional efforts to help African Americans um, in the wake of the Civil War. So we're very quickly shaping up to have a, a South that seems like, oh, fine, nothing really happened. We'll just go back to life as we knew it. Um, so there's no intention in the South of giving land to African Americans, no intention of, you know, repaying them for all the labor that they did. Um, historians have calculated that it would be several trillion dollars if we actually paid slaves for all the work that they did unpaid. Um, the only thing that was allowed to Southern African Americans were possibilities for education so they could go to school and Northerners went down to teach school. Um, and African Americans could hold public office in the South if they could, you know, get someone to vote for them. Other than that, Southerners had no intention of treating African Americans on any terms of equality, and they were backed up by President Johnson in that opinion. Here's an illustration of Johnson vetoing the civil rights bill that was sent to him, as well as vetoing uh, the Freedmen's Bureau. In the second cartoon, he's actually kicking the Freedmen's Bureau down the stairs and little black people are falling out of it. Clever cartoonist. This illustration shows what many Northerners thought would happen for African Americans after the war. You know, they turned from slaves into just middle class black people who'd have the same kind of homes and clothing as ordinary middle class white folks and their children would grow up under the watchful eye of presidents hanging on the wall. But the reality is far different. Um, as we've already seen that Southerners have, no, Southerners have no intention of treating African Americans in any way that shows equality. In fact, many Southerners blamed the federal government for subsidizing the laziness of ex-slaves. There was a large amount of criticism that the Freedmen's Bureau simply made slaves lazy. It gave them plenty of food and had no incentive to work. And they just spend you know, their days sitting around picking the banjo. This cartoon suggests that the Freedmen's Bureau was a plot by Northern congressmen to keep the black man lazy at the expense of the white man. So it's deliberately using racist uh, sort of language to foster racial tension. The cartoonist suggests that, you know, if you support the president who vetoed the Freedmen's Bureau, um, you support the right point of view and you protect the white man who is apparently over here working hard while the black man's laying back and taking a nap. Um, African Americans did take advantage of their uh, rights to education, so they flooded into schools. African Americans of all ages um, came to learn to read and were taught by Northern teachers. Uh, several thousand Northern teachers moved to the South after the war to open these freedmen's schools. Um, and it was necessary because 90% of all the ex-slaves were illiterate. So we have a situation now where it seems like the president and the South are basically conspiring to let the South get away with the war and get away with not treating African-Americans with any respect or equality. In response to that, 
a group of northern republicans got super angry these republicans got so hot and bothered by president johnson and his leniency that we call them radical republicans and they decided that the south needed to be punished the south needed a whipping so the first thing they did was they refused to seat all these Southern Confederates in Congress, uh, which is constitutional. Um, you can have Congress decide the qualifications of its own members and they can kick people out. They decided to push forth with the idea of a 14th Amendment. That is, we've ended slavery in the 13th Amendment, but we need more. And this 14th Amendment would address the question of equality. It would make African Americans citizens of the United States and give them the same legal equality as white people had. Um, the equality came in two, two ways. You would be protected equally under the law, equal protection. And then if the law was applied to you, it would be applied to you to protect your due process. You wouldn't have your rights taken away without following a set of steps to make sure that that was fair and equal. Of course, this angered the South and angered President Johnson. But it didn't matter because in 1866, the radical Republicans gain enough members of Congress to have a veto-proof majority so they can basically do whatever they want in Congress after the 1866 elections. So in 1867, with their newfound power, they passed the Reconstruction Act, where they take the South to the woodshed, pull off the radical Republican belt, and lay some heavy punishment on the South. First of all, the South was divided into five military districts, that itself is pretty punishing to lose your right to self-government and to be under the control of the U.S. Army. Secondly, they tell all the southern states, you've got to rewrite your constitution. Your old constitution is not good enough. You need to accept the 14th Amendment, which we've just written and handed out to you, and you need to grant African-American men the right to vote. This Reconstruction Act was intended directly to punish Southerners, to make them feel bad for having started the war, to make them feel bad for not feeling bad enough after the war, and to make them treat African-Americans with the kind of equality that African-Americans deserved. Johnson fumed. He was angry. Um, he felt like Congress was stealing his role in Reconstruction. And he tried to block the efforts of the radicals um, in the few limited ways that he could. Eventually, he ticked them off enough that they brought an impeachment and trial effort against him because he uh, violated an obscure and actually pretty ridiculous law. So they took him to court um, and tried to get him thrown out of office, uh, but in the trial, it failed by a single vote and he remained um, president of the United States. This cartoonist, uh, Thomas Nast, whose cartoons we're gonna see a lot of um, over the next few units, um, tried to illustrate this problem of the South not feeling guilty versus their treatment of the North. Um, so notice here on one side, the Southerners are kind of, you know, begging for forgiveness kind of ish. Um, and they're getting pardoned by President Johnson as, as a result of their begging. And so Nast asks, why should these guys get pardoned? Why should they be allowed to be part of the country, but this guy not be? Look at him. He's dressed as a soldier. He's been injured in the war. Doesn't he also deserve freedom? 
And Nast even went a step further in this cartoon when he titled it Franchise, implying that this guy also deserves the right to vote, whereas these guys don't. The trial of the president, President Johnson, our first impeachment and trial effort against the president, um, was public. You could get tickets for it to go watch it. And this uh, cartoonist illustrates the number of women who came to watch. Oh, scandalous. Women watching politics. So the South, under punishment, begins the process of rewriting its state constitutions. These new constitutions um, would eventually get Southerners back in the Union by 1870. Um, it'd take a couple of years, but most of the Southern states will get everything together and rejoin the Union. Um, the constitutions themselves were pretty liberal, meaning they granted a whole lot of freedom um, and used the government to promote benefits for a lot of different people. Uh, for example, legal equality, voting rights. Many of the constitutions gave money to public education, as well as internal improvements like the building of railroads. So these are very not Southern constitutions at all. Um, these sound very much like Northern constitutions. So what's the reason for all that? Well, 30% of the delegates to write these constitutions were African Americans. So one third of the people helping to write these new state governments were black people. Another quarter of them were northerners who had gone down to the south to uh, help southern states, you know, clean up their act. We call them carpetbaggers because they supposedly took all their possessions in a bag. Um, and bags at this time, one of the popular ways uh, you would see a bag would be a bag basically made of carpet material. It's pretty durable, pretty sturdy. Um, the idea of making African Americans legal citizens of the United States and make them equal under the law is incorporated into our Constitution in the 14th Amendment, and that goes into effect in 1868. Um, so it's first proposed um, in 1866, and then two, two years later, it gets enough support to make it. But the next one that goes into our Constitution is a pretty significant one, and it's the 15th Amendment. That would grant African Americans the right to vote, um, but only males. This amendment to the Constitution, which goes into effect in 1870, angered women's rights leaders. Remember all those women who had fought for abolition and fought for freedom for African Americans? Well, they feel betrayed that they don't get the right to vote, but black men do. Here's just a chart illustrating uh, the number of black uh, folks and white folks who are participating in the rewriting of constitutions. Only in South Carolina do black folks make up a majority of the members. Louisiana is right next to that at 50-50. Most of the rest of the states, um, 40, 24, 11, 13. Um, and you're probably wondering, who are these African Americans helping write these constitutions? Most of them are middle class African Americans um, who are leaders in their communities, um, who are recognized, they're preachers. Um, some of them are. Um, recognized for their leadership uh, and eventually would go on to serve in the U.S. Congress and in their own state governments as well. In the election of 1868, Republicans wanted to maintain their control over the government. And they did so by waving the bloody shirt. That means referencing the war. And to do that, you would simply hold up a uniform of some soldier who had died in the war and say, look at this uniform. Look at the blood that this guy left on his uniform as he died for the Union. Are you going to vote Democrat? Heck no. You're going to vote Republican. 
And this is a pretty successful tactic. Um, it's very much an appeal to pathos. Going along with that, the Republicans nominate a war hero. Hmm, nobody's ever done that before, have they? Um, and the war hero is Ulysses S. Grant. Um, so he brings to the candidacy pretty much nothing except for the fact that he helped win the war. Um, he is, even before the war, not particularly even a good soldier. Um, so his real only claim to fame is being a war hero. The Democrats nominate a white supremacist named Horatio Seymour. Could have been our president, President Seymour. Um, and the Democrats began to turn to violence to intimidate voters. Um, by this point, the KKK has been formed, the Ku Klux Klan. Um, and they went out um, in disguise, suppressing voters um, with threats, intimidation, and violence. Grant wins because he's a war hero, but he turns out to be one of the most scandal-ridden presidents in American history. Um, he's a personally pretty competent and honest guy, I mean, fairly on the level but absolutely incompetent when it comes to watching over his cabinet officials and what's going on in his presidency. Three of his cabinet members are actually guilty of being involved in all kinds of schemes, bribes, um, unethical behaviors. And so he becomes the target of a sort of smear campaign that he is absolutely unfit to be president. Um, Re Reconstruction itself comes to be associated with corruption. You got a corrupt president who's actually not corrupt, but a lot of his associates are. So people go, well, got a corrupt president. The Republicans must be corrupt. And the Democrats push this narrative of, you know, corruption and attach to it the idea that not only is the North corrupt, but the South is being overrun by Negro rule, which is itself not true either. Remember, only one third of African Americans were involved in the writing of state constitutions. African Americans nowhere have a majority of dominance in state governments, with the exception of South Carolina. And so there's this sort of spin put on Grant. Grant's corrupt, Republicans are corrupt, Reconstruction's corrupt, Negro's corrupt, everything's corrupt, this whole courtroom is corrupt. Um, and that narrative, which is a fake news narrative, it's not actually accurate at all, helps cause declining Northern support for Reconstruction. A lot of Northerners are sort of turned off for the idea of reconstructing the South and guaranteeing African American equality and punishing Southerners. Um, you see a lot of racist appeals during Reconstruction, such as this one, to suggest that anybody who votes Republican, who votes for um, African-American equality, African-American freedom, African-American voting rights, um, you are voting for stupidity, ignorance. Um, and so the cartoonist has drawn this African-American in a way to exaggerate facial features, to suggest stupidity. Meanwhile, our exemplar white person over here has a giant forehead, and he's supposed to be thoughtful. So you better vote for Climber so that you can vote for the white man. Here is Horatio Seymour um, and his running mate, Frank P. Blair of Missouri, Grant and his running mate, Schuyler Colfax. Um, you can see the election results turn out pretty well for Grant. Look at all the blue. Not too bad. Thomas Nast. I told you a lot of cartoons. Nast drew a number of cartoons to show how the Democrats were linking up with former Confederates and then using the votes of the ignorant and savage Irish to try to suppress the black man. 
Uh, so Na NAST has got a very uh, pointed take on reconstruction. And notice this cartoonist suggests a similar thing, that if you were supported, if you supported the Confederacy during the war, then basically after the war, the KKK is the same thing. These cartoons suggest the depth of corruption in Grant's administration. Yes, he's personally a pretty okay guy, but he didn't really aggressively take on the corruption all that well. And so cartoonists had a field day showing his indirect support for all of these bad behaviors going on where there's theft and bribery and fraud and basically everything unethical you could think of. A number of scandals. Um, Grant kept promising that he would get to the very bottom of all of them, and here he is drowning in the very bottom of all those scandals uh, that are going on. The fake news narrative of Reconstruction being corrupt was pushed in this particular cartoon to suggest that African Americans, ignorant and dumb African Americans, were ruining the governments of the South. This poor man's like, oh dear God, I need an Advil. Oh. Um, exasperated white folks um, wishing that these savage and ignorant African Americans would stop ruining um, their states. When in fact, African Americans never made up a majority of states, governments at all, and so this is definitely a fake news narrative. But even though um, we know that very few state offices went to African Americans, 15%, um, the fake news narrative um, started producing its own backlash in which um, fewer and fewer African Americans would be getting elected to office. So we sort of have this wave of lots of African Americans in politics and then the Democrats pushing back and you see many African Americans being driven out. You see a lot more violence, particularly by the KKK, to shut down Republican wins in the South. It almost becomes hard to be a Southern Republican and even win an election. Grant himself was afraid to use federal power to shut down the KKK. So he wasn't aggressive enough in going after all of these violent Democrats in the South, these violent racist Democrats. Um, when they did go after some Klansmen, they punished about 600 of them pretty lightly. That is no harsh uh, treatment for these guys, but sort of more like bad, bad Klansmen. Go to your room, think about what you've done. By 1872, the fake news narrative about co corruption in Reconstruction leads to a split in the Republican Party. A group of Republicans actually start talking about small government. Whoa. They actually borrow what would we would consider to be democratic ideas. And they talk about, we've done enough for African Americans. They can figure out the rest of their lives for themselves. We don't need to support them anymore. And then, just when you think things couldn't get any worse, they get worse. They get worse because of an economic downturn, which always makes people turn away from doing good and doing things to help others, and they just think, what can I do to survive and take care of myself? Economic downturns <coughs> tend to bring out the worst in people. In this case, it was caused by excessive speculation on railroads. One single company triggering the whole panic. But the federal government did make it worse by demanding hard money, hard money policies. Remember during the Civil War, they printed paper money? Well, Grant and other Republicans wanted to take that paper money out of circulation, which limited the amount of money that was available, limited people's access to credit. And so 
the economy is crashing, people can't get enough money to make it. Employment rate goes to 14% during this depression, so this is pretty bad. Um, Northerners are increasingly just tired of reconstruction. They're like, fix the economy. Who cares about black people? Who cares about the South? We're just hungry and the economy is bad. So this age in which African Americans you know, could serve in Congress, like these guys here, the first colored senator and representatives in the 41st and 42nd Congress, that age is going to slowly recede and go away as the will to keep fighting Reconstruction just dies. And that will is undermined, um, that will is sort of you know, threatened by, directly by the KKK, who, by the way, did not have fancy white outfits in the 1870s. They dressed basically in potato sacks, covered their faces, they even covered the faces of their horses because people could identify your horse. Why are they disputed? They're disputed because there's so much violence and fraud and intimidation against African Americans in the South that it's not clear if the elections that took place in Florida, Louisiana, and South Carolina were even legally done. African Americans, if they even tried to vote, um, would be faced with KKK violence. This guy who's got a knife behind his back. Um, plus, people are also in a panic about the nation's economy, shown here as blowing up Wall Street, or here is a guy sweeping up the trash, the garbage of Wall Street. Um, so people are kind of just overall on edge. There's a lot of distrust, a lot of discord. So. We've got an election that's disputed. We've got Northerners not wishing to go forward with Reconstruction. And then we're gonna add one more thing to make it even worse, the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court began issuing a number of decisions in the 1870s and 1880s that limited the 14th Amendment and the 15th Amendment and basically opened the door for discrimination against African Americans. As violence was used to intimidate Republican voters, the Republicans disappear in the South. We get the disputed election. And the result of that election is it's going to go to Hayes. There's a secret bargain done at a hotel in Washington, D.C., and that bargain basically pushes the disputed votes to Hayes, but Hayes has got to make a promise in return. So that's going to set us up for the next election, the election of 1876, featuring Rutherford B. Hayes of Ohio, that's right, and William A. Wheeler, against Samuel Tilden and Thomas Hendricks. In the end, Tilden should have won. Should have won. Had more electoral votes. Um, definitely had the support of a lot of folks, both in the North, you can see here blue, even in New York, as well as the South. But the problem are these places here, South Carolina, Louisiana, Florida, and this little sliver over here of Oregon. Those are all disputed votes. And we're not entirely sure who should get them. Probably should have been. Told. 
Is a cartoon just illustrating violence? Of course he wants to vote for the Democratic ticket. Sure he does. Hayes's promise is known as the Compromise of 1877. Um, it will be an end to military occupation in the South, shown in this cartoon here. Grant, here's Grant, with military rule over the solid South, weapons, 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 weapons. Here is Hayes with his leave them alone policy. So the troops are taken out of the South and they're taken to the North where they're used to put down the Great Railroad Strike and crush the labor movement. Secondly, Hayes has to promise money for a Southern Transcontinental Railroad. And in return for these promises, he gets to be president and the Republicans remain in power for four more years. So what's the long-term impact of Reconstruction? Well, if you measure it by politics, we've already seen that there's a sort of like brief little bubble moment where things are good and there's things are looking up and African-Americans vote and they're equal under the law, but then that recedes. If you measure by economics, you have to take a look at sharecropping, which is a new system invented after the war to basically keep African-Americans in the black belt in a form of quasi-slavery. The way it works is this. A sharecropper rents land from the owner, and at the end of the year, he will pay his rent with half the crop. Meanwhile, he has to buy seeds and supplies on credit from the landowner, which is going to, have to pay back too. Sharecropper plants his crop. He gives the crop to the landowner, and the landowner keeps half of it for himself, sells the other half. But then he's also got to take money out of his pocket to pay for the seeds and supplies. The sharecropper ends up in the end finding out he's in debt. He's not made enough to pay both the rent and the supplies. And the debt means that he starts out the next year in a hole, and he's got to do even better next year to try to pay that off. What if he doesn't? You could actually be stuck in debt for all of your life, and you could never leave, never move, and never get out of debt. So you'd be growing cotton on a piece of property and never be able to leave it ever. What does that sound like? Slavery. That leaves a lot of historians to argue that Reconstruction is basically an unfinished revolution, and I'm stealing this from Eric Foner. Foner says that the circumstances after the, after the Civil War basically um, create a lot of promise for African Americans, like the 14th Amendment, the 15th Amendment, African Americans in political office, but then that promise is yanked away by the Supreme Court by Northerners who are not caring about Reconstruction anymore. Um, it's yanked away by Democrats who take back the South and then suppress African Americans in what many people consider to be worse than slavery. Social equality, according to Foner and many other historians, is never really truly addressed except for education. No Southerner is going to see an African American as his equal at all. So socially speaking, there's no equality there. Just education is the only grant of quality. Economically, sharecropping basically puts you in the same situation as you were under slavery, except you're just not owned, but you're still kind of owned. So it's an unfinished revolution, one that will not be completed for another 100 years and in some people's way of thinking is still not even completed fully. I would like to give Frederick Douglass the sort of last word on this idea of an unfinished revolution. When he says, to the freedman was given the machinery of liberty, the ability to have liberty, but then was denied them the steam to put it in motion. So had no power. It's like a car without gas. The old master class retained the power to starve them to death. 
And wherever this power is held, there is the power of slavery.